be multiple martial arts, although we, pro- we could probably do that, but that's not it. Men's Mondays at McDonald's, and we've been having a great time. We've just been going through some things in the Old Testament about what God's up to, but God's just been showing up and touching and changing people's lives. So there was one night, we, one night we had a meeting, I think it was three weeks ago, I had already left, and God did something that you had been asking for for a period of time, is that right? Yeah. Can you tell us what took place? I, uh, I'll hold it, you just talk. Are you done chewing yet, or are you still eating? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've been struggling with drug addiction, cigarettes, porn, everything, you know, I live in the world, I've been homeless most of my life. But the Lord saved me back in 2009. And, you know, I've been praying for baptism of spirit and tongues, and, you know, the witness, you know, the, that the Bible speaks of. And, um, you know, it evaded me because I just, when I, after the Lord redeemed me, I didn't feel I was worthy. Mm. You know, I've been a drug addict. I've done everything under the sun. And, um, <laughs> probably more than <laughs> but, um, so three weeks ago, David and Dan, Dan, after the Bible study was over, we're in McDonald's there. Dan needed somebody to pray with him in agreement for what he's going through with his, his what the Lord set in front of him. And um, so we all sat down to pray. And, and I asked for people to agree with me, you know, on my living situation and whatnot. And God is good, and he has a sense of humor. <laughs> So they asked me if I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit and tongues. And I said, no, it's something that's always obeyed me. And, um, and they said, tonight's your night. So we sat down there at McDonald's, and three of us started praying. And God baptized me in the Holy Spirit that night. Thank you, Jesus. And, um, you know, I say he has a sense of humor because we asked that my living situation would be revealed to me. And, and everything, and um, so I went home that night to where I was staying at, and uh, that very night, the devil said upon us, and the girl I was staying with, we got in this major blowout, I mean major, and, um, and I grabbed my stuff and walked out the door, and I went to my brother's, and uh, yeah, I'm living up on the top of Whitbeck Hill, South Hills up there, and you know, not in the best of shape after 44 years of cigarettes and pot in each hand, you know. And uh, I hate that hill. I've always hated that hill. But but I went up that hill that night. And, um, you know, because the Lord's put me back in that house a dozen times in the last four years for some reason. I always have a place there with my brother. And um, he, he works on the coast, and he just comes home on the weekend. And his roommate, he just took off on a two-month trip. So I've got the house completely to myself, you know. And um, he got it just continuously blessing me, you know. And and so for anybody that's here, I I simply say, keep pressing through. Just stand in faith, you know. God is there even when we don't see him, when we don't feel him. and if you're here today, he has a plan for your life that is going to blow your mind. <laughs> yeah. Praise God. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. Woo! So those guys were like praying in tongues in McDonald's. Because we believe that the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking with other tongues. So we're excited about what God's doing in Tom's life in your life, and everyone's life, and hopefully in my microphone. It's going to get deliverance, because I thought it really sounded pretty good when I started, but all of a sudden it went somewhere. <laughs> you getting better? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I don't need any high ends. <laughs> Grab your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Acts. Uh, I'm also going to be opening up on uh, Saturday, for the next two Saturdays prior to our Easter weekend celebration, prayer at 7 o'clock. If any of you would like to come and join me, have you know, again, it's just pressing in for all that God wants to do. So go to the book of Acts, if you would please, chapter 14, 
and we'll start at verse 21. Uh, I've been doing a series entitled The Missional Church. How many of you know we're all missional? Look at your neighbor and say he's talking to you right now. We are all to be missional. Nobody's exempt. Not everybody's evangelist. That's a fivefold gift ministry, but everybody's to witness. And here's just a little witnessing tool. You can use this invite card as a tool to invite people. Very simple, practical way. Anybody know how many people live in the city of Eugene proper? Well, that doesn't tell me anything. I want specifics. I know there's a lot. How many? How many? 157,100. How many people live in Springfield? Uh, close. 58,010. So the total is 215,110 between Eugene Springfield proper. That's not including the outlying areas. That's not including those of you that live in Harrisburg, Junction City, Monroe, uh, that live in Venita, Elmira, uh, to, out to, uh, yeah, that way, and then up to, to, to Springfield and Thurston, and then Vida, Blue River, and then down south to Curtin, Cresswell, and Cottage Grove. Anybody live in any of those areas? Hallelujah. You need to get this mindset. Our church is not just a neighborhood church. I've never been called the pastor neighborhood church. I've always been called the pastor church that's drawing people from all over the place because that's our vision. Okay. So that's really what an apostolic church does. They are drawing people from all kinds of places. I mean, people will drive right by a church that's down the street of them to get where they need to go because of what God's doing in that house. And I've said this countless times, and I'll say it again. There are people sitting in churches right now that should be in this house because they're fish out of water. They're sitting there trying to change the culture and the DNA of that house, and they have no business doing it. They need to get where they belong, that if they're spirit-filled, full of the Holy Ghost, on fire, fire-breathing men and women of God who love the presence of God, signs, wonders, and miracles, and the prophetic flow, then this is where you need to be. Don't try to change that house. God will change the leader and he'll change the house. You being there is only causing conflict. So we have 215,110 proper in the city of Eugene. As you've been following along in this teaching, I said that the city of Antioch has basically at the time that Paul writes to the church and is ministering there, actually when Luke's talking about because he's the writer of Acts, at that time it has 500,000 people. 500,000. So that's almost double what we have right here. A little over double what we have right here right now. Is that right? It's a lot of folks. And of those, it's the third leading city of the, of the of Roman Empire at that time. Only Rome itself and Alexandria and Northern Africa being larger cities and more impact and having more global influence. It's third in line. Some of you know it's a very strategic city. And so as we look at this teaching, we've been talking about the different things that uh, are, are I think, indicative of what an apostolic church is. And uh, the message has been entitled The Outreach to Antioch, and we've been going through it. I have uh, 10 points, and we've gotten all the way down to, ch to number eight today. We'll get down to number eight today. If you've been with us, point number one is that it's multicultural. Number two, it's spirit-driven or spirit-led. Number three, it's leader-led. Number four, it's a teaching training center. Number five, it is fivefold influence. I won't reteach each of these points. You can get the CDs, you can get the DVDs. Number six, it plants churches. Number seven, it strengthens and encourages. And that's where I left off last week. I'll pick up with point number eight today. And I believe by the Spirit of God, I will get done. Yeah. Barring an earthquake or tornado or something like that. I was on the phone with a friend of mine and he lives in Southern California, born and raised there. He's born down in East L.A. Pico Rivera is where he came from, and he's made it all the way up to Phillips Ranch now is where he lives, and he's not down there in the lowriders low riders riding up down in uh, the, uh, the, the boulevard. You know, he's, he's out in Phillips Ranch now. But I was talking to him about the earthquake. You know, they had an earthquake, four point whatever, just over the weekend, some tremblers after that. So I said, I said something, I said something to the effect of, I, I says. I don't know, some comment goes, oh, these guys are a bunch of babies around here. That was nothing but shakers. That's all that was, was shakers, he was saying. And I says, well, they emptied, I said, they emptied Disneyland that night at nine o'clock. Everybody peeled out of there. He goes, oh, I'm here today. It's all good, he says. It's, it's wonderful. And so he's down there. He's surfing in a church down there, and he's loving Jesus. How many of you know it also plants churches, and it strengthens in churches? And number eight, it appoints five-fold leaders. Take a look at verse 23, the book of Acts chapter 14. Verse 23 says this. 
Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the word of the Lord who they had put their trust and after going through Pisidia they came to Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Pergia they went down to Adalia. Those are a bunch of Greek names. Now remember Paul also wrote the book of Galatians. Galatians is a province. Province meaning that it's a territory, an area. In that province is northern Galatia, southern Galatia. These churches have to be in the southern part of Galatia that he later on writes this book called Galatians 2. And we'll allude to that in a little bit. And I want you to understand this because I want you to be learned and trained men and women of God. Do I hear an amen? amen. The Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourselves approved unto God, workmen who needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That means that in this day, when every imaginable thing is being preached for, from pulpits, you are not eating it up hook, line, and sinker, but you weigh it and does it line up with scripture? Does it line up with Scripture? So note this. It says they went back to... Now, they spent a year. Remember, he and Barnabas, they went out and they did this missionary journey. We call it the first missionary journey. And they went out, and for one year, they went and they established these churches. He says, all right, on our way back to Antioch in Syria, let's cruise back through. Let's appoint elders in those churches, and then we're going to go back. So that's what they did. They came home. This is the first, what we would call, missionary movement. Do you know that it's really important that missionaries contextualize what they're doing in the areas they're reaching? Now, I'm going to describe that. It's a great big word. It's a $25 word, but I want to help you now. Come on, say, I'm smart. Look at your neighbor and say, you're smart. You're in a college class right now. Contextualization is just a great big word that we use that we identify with the people that we're reaching. So when they went there, the reason they went there, Paul, remember, was a Roman citizen of New Mean City. He was from Tarsus. Barnabas was from Cyprus. So they understood the Greek mindset. They didn't send the great big Jew guys down there because they didn't relate to the Greek mindset. How many of you know when you're relating to a people group, you've got to begin to begin to understand their language. You've got to be under, understand what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean you become absolutely like them. I believe that we're in the world, but not of the world. Do I hear an Amen. However, you will gain a greater hearing if you can begin to be more like the people in the area without compromising the truth. Case in point, I used to wear suits. I love suits. I would dress every time I would go out of town uh, and I would go someplace, I would go to like, whether it was to Orlando or to Seattle, they have specialty suit shops. You could go in, you get suits for uh, a lot of money for a lot less money because of the, the prices on them and all that. They had these great suits. And so my boys, John Mark and I, we'd always go to, to this place. What was the name of that? Do you remember the place John Mark would go to? It was, there's one in Seattle, there's one in, down in, in, in Orlando. And we get these suits and you know John Mark and Matt had one on, I had one on, and we, and we were just styling, looking good shoes, all that. I look good. But how many of you know, not everybody's wearing suits in Eugene anymore. I have a closet full of suits, but I don't wear them very often. I wear them very, you know, periodically for, you know, very special events, those types of things. Why? Because our culture does not dictate it. Now, if I lived in the South, Bible Belt, y'all, how many of you know, they're still wearing suits down there to church every Sunday because it's the culture. And in order to be contextually relevant, you would probably wear a suit. Not, not necessarily. But I'm trying to help you understand something. Do you, anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of Hudson Taylor? Anybody ever heard of Hudson Taylor? He is the first modern missionary and that started the modern missionary movement. He went into China. He called his, his organization the Inland China Mission. Now you say, why is this important? Because when he went in there, one of the things that he did is that though he being a person of European descent went to a place of Asian descent, how do you know they dress differently and they look differently? So when he showed up with his apparel in order to win them, you know what he had to do? He had to learn to love Chinese food. I like Chinese food, by the way. I like all the different forms of Chinese food. I like using my sticks. Whenever I go to a restaurant, I say, give me a pair of sticks, man. I go over here across the street to the Szechuan Z over here, whatever it is, and I need a pair of sticks. I eat with the sticks because I like the Chinese food. Now, Sherry, she doesn't care for Chinese food so much because it's really more of the smell. When you actually go to, to China and you go in, there's all kinds of smells associated with it. It may not be so good, but I like Chinese food. Now, the difference also was this, that when, when he would go into the place, he was one of the first people that also changed his apparel. He didn't go in wearing the three-piece suit of the day. What he did is he actually wore one of the Chinese silk suits that they wear. That's what he did. He adopted and changed his dress. Why? Because he contextualized his, his clothing to fit within the culture, whereby he gained a hearing to the people that he could share the good news with them because they could receive him. He wasn't out of place. Now, if you come into a place and you look like a goofball and you dress differently than everybody else in the place, you are known for what you're looking like because you're a goofball, because you've not contextualized yourself. 
Oh, I want to be delicate here. <laughs> How many of you love the Amish people? They're not living in the same arena we're living in. Do they love Jesus? Yes. Are they going to heaven? Yes. But they will minimize their impact because of their approach and style of ministry. And they become introverted rather than extroverted. And their impact will be lessened because of style of dress, because they can't even drive a car, because they're still driving a horse and a buggy. I'm going to tell you, a horse and a buggy does not sanctify anybody. In fact, a poo-poo that comes out the back end, you need to get rid of that. Smile at me real big. So these guys go back through, they appoint these apostles, Barnabas and Paul, they go back through and they're appointing these now leaders in these churches. We would call them, commonly call them elders or pastors over the house. And so they go back and do that. And I want you to go with me to the book of uh, Titus. Don't lose your place in Acts because we'll come back there. In the book of Titus, if you're wondering where that is, it's after First and Second Timothy. And I want you to go to the book of Titus chapter 2, no, excuse me, Titus chapter 1, verse 5 down through verse number 9. I was talking with some of the guys that I'm mentoring. I, I, I'm, I, we, we have some interns that are here in the house, and I'm mentoring a couple of guys, and this discussion came up. One of them texts me and says, what do you require for those who preach at church? So I thought about that. How many of you know you can just give people answers, and that doesn't always help them? I says, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to go to the Bible. I'd like you to find from the New Testament you deem as necessary for being the requirements for somebody who stands up and preaches before the people of God. So that was a good assignment. The person went and did it. Then we came back and we dialogued together. But one of the scriptures that we landed upon is this one in the book of Titus chapter 1, verse 5. It says this, the reason I left you in Crete, this is now speaking to Titus, he says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint, everybody say appoint, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, here's the qualification for an elder. Are you ready? And by the way, the word elder, we're using interchangeably. Elder, presbyter, 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 elder, pastor, they're used interchangeably. One has to do with the title, the other has to do with the function, and the other has to do with oversight. He says, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. How many you know that that's a good idea for that to be a qualification for somebody who stands up and preaches the Word of God? If you would go to the book of James, James says in chapter 3, verse 1, not everyone ought to presume to teach because those who teach will be judged with a stricter judgment because they're influencing people. Whenever anybody stands behind this pulpit, they're influencing. That, that, that's why I need to know who is it that labors among us. I'm not letting any Tom, Dick, and Harry come up here and let them rip and, and, and go for it. They have been filtered on purpose, unapologetically. It is my good job as a steward of the household that God's entrusted me to have oversight over to know who labors among us. Do I hear an amen? amen? So what they did is they appointed these people. Now, having said that, let me say this. There's a friend of mine by the name of Butch Plummer. He's gone to heaven. He pastored down in Southern California, very effective leader in the body of Christ. I was sitting with Butch one time. We were at a gathering. There was like three or four of us pastors together. We were dialoguing about pastors and elders and things like that. And he says, you know what? It's my conviction. He says, I believe this ought to be the standard for every believer, not just a pastor, but this ought to be everybody's standard. And I says, you're right, Butch. And I just took that on since that point in time. And I said, I agree with that. Why does, why does the common believer have one level and somebody else has another level? Isn't that something we all ought to aspire to? So... He says, that, he says there, this is the qualifications in the same way. They went back to, they appointed these leaders, and then notice this, they committed them to the Lord. All right, God, they're in your hands. They didn't become dictatorial. They didn't usurp authority for them. They became the leaders of that house. So if at any time, Paul, Silas, Barnabas, whomever came back, guess what? The authority in the house was that person they had now put into place. In any house... I don't care what any five-fold ministry goes in. If they're a good five-fold ministry and they want to come back and be invited back, they better submit to the authority to the house. Yeah. I teach this, I preach this, I practice this. When I go preach for somebody else, I ask them what I can or cannot do before I do it. Why? Because it's just good protocol. 
They're the shepherd of that house. I am there underneath them and their authority in that house. So we see this, number nine, point number nine. Go back to the book of Acts now. Take a look, if you would, please, at verse 14, chapter 14, verses 26 through 28. 26 through 28. It says, from Adelaide, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God. So this is now a year has transpired since they started their journey in Acts 13. They had been sent off by the prophets and the teachers. They laid hands on them. They blessed them. They sent them out. Now they finished their journey. They'd gone back through, had <clears throat> laid hands on, imparted, and blessed, set into, into motion elders. Now it says in verse 26, from Adelaide, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. I mean, it's a good thing to complete some things. You know, it's not important just how you start. Can you finish the deal? Can you finish the assignment? God's looking for men and women of God. Is that anybody in the house? Say, that's me. That when you've been given a task or an assignment, will you complete it? Will you do it? That when you say yes to that, you read the fine print so that when you know what you're supposed to be doing, you do it. So if you say, I will be a greeter, I'll be an usher. I'll bring a nursery worker. I will be there at the time that you say that you're supposed to be there. I'll accomplish my task, and I'll complete it to the glory of God. Right? Amen. Good. Look at somebody and say he's talking to you right now. <clears throat> oh, I want a worldwide ministry. Bless God, I want a worldwide ministry. But you can't show up 20 minutes before and stand at the door when you're supposed to be there. Bless God, I want a worldwide ministry. I want to travel all over the world. Can't follow a simple instruction. Not everybody will talk like this. So I'm just telling you right now. Oh, well, they might leave, Pastor. You shouldn't talk to people that way. They might leave. I mean, you know, you don't go to a job and not do what you've been asked to do on your job. You can't, you can't call in sick four days out of five and think you're going to have a job in it for any length of time. And rightfully so. Somebody else will be waiting to be, be right there where you're at. Oh, I got a sniffle. I don't think I can make it in today. I got a tummy ache. I don't think I can make it in today. In Jesus' name, be healed. Lay hands on yourself. Get some breakthrough. Get some press through. Stir yourself up and just go. Oh, man, this is going over good. How would I get onto this? You guys were praying for me back there that I would speak the words of God and they'd be powerful and anointed. And <laughs> My wife and I are going to do a series called How to Think and How to Act. Because sometimes Christianity is not a ooh, angels flying everywhere. Praise God, I'm in the glory zone. No, it's just getting out of bed every day at a certain time, getting up, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, combing your hair, getting a nice pa pair of clothes on, and going down and do what you're supposed to do at your job. Give them your eight hours or whatever it is you're going to do. Be a good testimony there, and then come home, love your wife, love your kids, don't beat your dog, don't beat anybody else. And that's just good Christianity. But oh no, we want the glory round. I'm too, I'm too anointed to wash any dishes. I'm too anointed to clean any toilets. I'm too anointed to, 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 to wash any dishes. I got to be in the glory realm. How many of you know you can be in the glory realm and still do those things? Come on, somebody. I can be buzzing down the road and be in the glory realm. I can be washing dishes and be in the glory realm. I can be washing a stinking car and be in the glory realm. I can be mowing the lawn, having a Holy Ghost breakout meeting while I'm mowing my backyard, while I'm not too happy with my dog because she's tearing it up as I speak. I find a new rhododendron bush chewed up and laid on my porch like it's a prize for me. Lambos daily. Am I helping anybody here today? Oh, I just must be talking to those watching by YouTube, television, or some other means. Now, see, we got to get serious with this stuff. Christianity, it bleeds into everything we do. Remember when I talked about being contextually contextualized when I started this message? Sometimes people aren't contextual because they're so whacked out in a weird zone that they just can't be normal. I mean, you can be still Holy Ghost filled and be normal. You can still show up and do what you're supposed to do. Thank you, Lloyd. 
Lloyd, by the way, did an awesome message last Wednesday. You need to get that. Are you up to bat this Wednesday? You're up to bat. Helen, you need to come. <clears throat> Where am I at? Praise God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm in a glory zone. Oh, God, zap me a good one. Ha, ha, ha. Now, I'm making fun, but I really believe in the glory. I believe in angels. I believe in his presence. I, I want that. I long for that. I, I desire all that. If the Holy Ghost comes in here and we all break out in a Holy Ghost laughter meeting, I'm for it. If we're all on the floor, I'm for it. Are you hearing me? I, do, I want to put it in perspective. But there are also things that we have to get done that are just normal, everyday, contextual things that will win us a hearing to the unbeliever. Okay, I'm almost done with verse 27 here. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, through them, through them, through them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So now they go out on a missionary journey. This whole thing starts from when, they, when, when he shows up there, he, Barnabas and Saul. It's about a five-year period of time, 45 AD to about 50 AD. So they're hanging out with the church. Then they get sent out. They go out. It's, a, it's a, a year. Then they teach for another year. And now here they are. They're celebrating. They come back and they tell everybody what's going on. They come on back and they celebrate the goodness of God. Write down Luke 15, 8 through 10. How many of you know the Bible says that even the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes home and repents? Come on, how about us? We ought to do the very same thing. We did it last week when somebody came to this altar and we, they repented and got right with God. We declared it. We, ex we were excited about it. I think about when I was in Russia 20 some years ago, the first time I did a a mass a crusade type of thing. We're there. I'm preaching on a Friday night, and I and and I and we give the altar call. And as I'm giving the altar call, this filled auditorium in in Ivanova, Russia. And I says, everyone who wants to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want you to raise your hand. Everybody raise their hand. I says, no, wait a minute. I want those only that want to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Raise your hand. They all raise their hand. I says, I want you to stand up. They all stood up. Come on, somebody. That is cause for rejoicing and shouting in the kingdom of God. And anybody who helped me by prayer or by sowing into that, they will reap the reward of that because of what they did to assist in that process. As I've said before, when uh, Jeff and Marilyn and I were in Gabon in 2012, at the end of that, when I gave the altar call and those thousands would stand up and they would get right with God and give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. How many of you know that's cause for rejoicing? How many of you know it doesn't matter like last week when this sister came down front and this other guy came down front and they got born again and rededicated their lives to Jesus Christ? How many of you know the angels of heaven were rejoicing and so were we? because we are celebrating God's victory. When Tom came up here a moment ago and shared his testimony of the transforming power of God, that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he finally broke through and received his prayer language sitting in a McDonald's of all places. And God filled him, and he spoke in tongues. Hallelujah. And is still speaking in tongues. So what were some of the victories? If you went back and you cruised through and you looked at chapter 12, and you looked at chapter 13, uh, actually after chapter 13, verses 4 on the way through. Here's just a recap of that. They went down to a place, and as they were there ministering, I mean, you know, Paul, when they went down to Cyprus, they were there in a place, and they were ministering, and what first thing they encountered, let me just tell you something. It almost seems like every time that God does something good for you, the enemy wants to come back with backlash and come against you against that. So you might as well be aware of that and just steal yourself against that and be in anticipation so you're not taking out. I was a kid. I was 12 years old when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was at a youth camp, came home. It was a Saturday. I was so full of joy and excited and everything else. And it was interesting. It was during the summertime. Some neighborhood kids came over and started giving us some grief, and we kind of got into a skirmish there, turned into a melee type of thing. And next thing you know, somebody called the cops, and the cops show up to my mom and dad's house, to our house, because us tourist boys got into it with somebody else across the way. Well, they really started it. But it was amazing. Here I'd just been speaking at the altar all week long. So hallelujah, praying, laying hands on people. They're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately this thing comes. It was not by happen chance or by chance. And now we're in the skirmish. And that which the enemy meant for evil, he tried to do something evil because he was counteracting that which God had done was good. So we got into this conflict and it was resolved. There was only a couple times cops ever came to our house. Don't look at me like that. None of you have ever had that happen, right? But 
they're celebrating God's victory. So they're down there in this island. And what happens, the first thing of ministry as God sent them out is they face this guy by the name of Simon Bar-Jesus. Anybody ever hear Simon Bar-Jesus? He's a sorcerer. It's right in the Bible. He is a warlock. He, in fact, probably scholars and theologians say he was like a regional territorial guy who affected the whole region. This is the gateway place. The first place they encounter is Simon Bar-Jesus. And you know what he does? He begins to come against the things of God and speak against it to Sergius Paulus, who is the Roman ruler over that area. How many of you know the enemy wants to have dominion over territories and regions and cities and nations, but he starts with people. This guy's full of demons, so much so that Paul comes against him and he says that in the name of Jesus, you're going to be blind for a season of time. This guy was trying to counteract and stop the move of God. He spoke to him. How many you know the power? This is the first power encounter that we see Paul having. And he says, you know what? The spirit of what we see is the spirit of God in Paul was greater than the spirit that was in Simon Bar Jesus. And he went blind for a season of time. Sergius Paulus knew it was of God. And he says, all right, I'm serving your God because your God is stronger. How many of you know we need a rising up of men and women of God in this day who are full of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of God when combated against the things of darkness and the works of the flesh and carnality and the demonic hordes. We come against them, not in our name, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that we see that dispelled and taken away in Jesus' name. And there's breakthrough that comes. Hallelujah. Now, he didn't go on taking on territorial spirits. He took on the territorial spirit that was in the guy who had dominion in that area. It was broken, and they began to go forward in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So they come back, and they tell him that. How many of you know a cheer ought to go up just like a cheer went up from you guys? Then they told him about, hey, I want to tell you about a story. We went to Lystra and Derby, and when we went there, there's a guy who's been lame in his feet. He had been there for, uh, from birth. He had never walked, but when he listened to us, and we saw that he had faith to heal, we prayed for him, and he was raised up, and he was made whole. Come on, somebody. That's shouting ground. And people were rejoicing. And have you know, if that happened around here, you know, people would know that. People would know that somebody had been healed. They'd never walked. How I many you know, they never walk, and then all of a sudden you're walking. Usually when you're a baby, you've got to learn to walk. My little Caleb, he's six months old. So he comes over to the house and mama sits him on the floor. Holly sits him on the floor like this. And this guy, he's like, he gets his butt up in the air and he's wanting, to, he's wanting to walk already. He wants to bypass, crawl. He wants to go right to walking. So grandpa holds him up and we'll walk around or whatever. But this guy's a charge ahead guy. Now he's still waddling around. And it's going to be a little bit, but he'll be walking one day. All right? Hopefully shortly soon. The point is this, is that, that you have to learn how to walk. This guy learned how to walk boom, like that. It was a miracle. He's telling the people, they're saying, yay, praise God. And you all think, well, that's awesome. But all of a sudden, after the heels of this, uh, they're, they're ministering in other places. And all of a sudden, what happens is then some people come down to this place and they stone Paul and leave him for dead. Most theologians and scholars believe he was actually dead. The, pre- the, the, the believers came around and prayed for him and he was raised up and walked and they began to minister on. How many of you know that ought to bring some glory to God? Yeah. I tell you what, that celebration... They were celebrating. They were rejoicing in the goodness of God. They were thanking God for what he had done. All right, quickly, point number 10. I, I told you I was going to get done with this. So number eight, what I say point number eight was? The point's fivefold leaders. Point number nine, it celebrates God's victories. You've got to celebrate some victories. When God does great things, you need to rejoice because he did it, you didn't. He just worked through you. You got to be a part of that. All right, number 10, it resolves conflicts. Fivefold apostolic churches, they resolve conflicts. Now, how many of you know no one is exempt from conflict? Well, maybe you're perfect. I don't know. Maybe anybody ever here not had a conflict in the last year? Let me see your hand. No one. My wife said to me last night, honey, I thought we had a great day today. We only had a couple times that it got a little heated. That was yesterday. What world are you living in? Because her and I are two different personalities, two different ways of thinking, two different ways of approaching. We always get to the same result. Just how we get there is different usually. 10, it resolves conflicts. All right, take a look at chapter 15. So all this is going good. However, some men come from Jerusalem to Syria, and they stir some problems up. You ready with me? <laughs> chapter 15, verse 1. Certain people came down from Judah 
Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So they went back to Jerusalem and said, hey, what do you guys think about this? How do you weigh in on this? It says the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, that means the Antioch church sent them on their way to Jerusalem, but on their way they were doing ministry. It says they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted, and this news made all the believers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, whom they reported everything God had done through them. So they gathered again. They convened a meeting. So came together the apostles, but also the the, the uh, elders. The elders remember the word. Elder, pastor, episcopos, overseer, presbyter, they're all the same. Now, here's what happens. So they come in. They gather these people together. Verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. In other words, you cannot be saved unless you become like a Jew, the males, by becoming circumcised. That was what they were saying. You couldn't be saved unless you're circumcised. Now, that wasn't good news to these guys. I've got to tell you right now in more ways than one, if you know what I mean. Yeah, ouch is right. It's one thing when the boy's eight days old. Okay. Verse number six. The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Note how they let Peter go first. Peter uh, is, the, is the guy that was the apostle that really carried the weight and the mantle of this first group when they began to, uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. He's that apostle. And he stands up and he speaks and he says, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Everybody, who was that? Who was he talking about? What was he talking about? Cornelius, Acts 10. He was a Gentile. He went and ministered to him. Remember, vision, dream, angels, all that. Sheets coming down out of heaven three times. Remember that? That's why I can go eat some lobster today if I wanted to. (laughs) Crab. If I so desire. Because you couldn't do that under the Jewish law. It was unclean. Okay? No porky pig. No ham. It'd do a death blow to my wife. She loves ribs. She loves ribs. Pulled pork, ribs, all that good stuff. Yeah, you're right. How do we always get on food? Yes, I know. God who, this is verse 8 now, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between them and us for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of a Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is as though the grace, the unmerited favor of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So Peter stands up. He was what the Catholics would call the first the first pope. He's the head bishop. He's the high muckety-muck, if you want to put it in today's vernacular. He's got the man. He's got the goods. And he says, you know what? The Lord made no distinction. And how I know is because they got saved, and then immediately they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then they spoke in tongues. It wasn't at McDonald's, but it was at Cornelius' house, and we knew it was the real deal. So we cannot say that they have to now be circumcised in order to be saved, because you got to get saved first before you can speak in tongues. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. Are you following me, saints? So he affirms it and says, yes, you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to become a Jew in order to be born again. Stay with me. This is good stuff. Verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas. Now Barnabas and Saul, they they cut loose, telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, so these guys now, they share their piece. It's a a soundbite. It's not as much. I'm sure it's more in depth than we give it in the text, but it's what Luke tells us. Now verse, so you have Peter. Then Barnabas and Paul tells what's happening. So they're all saying, no, you don't have to be a Jew to be saved. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Are you with me? Verse 13. When they had finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Now, by the way, James is not Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers. James is already dead. He's been, he's been killed. He's been martyred. This is James the just. This is Jesus' half-brother. He is now the leader. He is the head pastor. He's the lead pastor at the church at Jerusalem. You know what they called him? You know what his nickname was? He's the same guy that wrote the book of James, by the way. You know what they called him? Camel knees. Why? Because he prayed so much. Literally, historians tell us, that, that history tells us his name was Camel knees because he prayed so much. He's also known as James the Just. 
It says then, going on in the text, James speaks up now because he's the pastor of the church. He's the lead pastor. He says, brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened and chose. Notice how he used Simon, not Peter, his Hebrew name, why he's talking to Jews. He wants them to know. Let me tell you something. I want to gain influence here. And he says then, he says how Simon, going on, first uh, da, 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 has described us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. So now he appeals to the prophets. I mean, that'll go over good because he goes to the Old Testament. By the way, he doesn't read from the Masoretic text. He doesn't write, read from the Hebrew. He reads from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Come on, somebody say that's good stuff. Come on, you guys are college students right now. Stay with me. Don't zone out on me. Okay, so he says... After this, he quotes Amos 9, 11, and 12, if you want to know where he quotes from. After this, I'll return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. Come on, somebody, because it's all about opening it up to the Gentiles. If, uh, i, I got to read it first, then I'll, then I'll elaborate. He says, I'll restore it, that the rest, now get this, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Come on, somebody. I want in our body, I want every color of person that is out there in wherever land to be a part of our church body. I want red, yellow, black, and white because it's to the entirety of the nations. I want the Native Americans with us. I want the African Americans with us. I want the Spanish speakers that are with us. Come on. Is anybody with me today? Because it's for all mankind. I want the whitey tidies with us. I want everybody with us. Yes, because that's the composite of the body of Christ. That all mankind, I'm, I'm emphasizing things because I want you to get this in your spirit. Because you know what? In some places, the most, the most, seg- the most segregated time of the day is the, the two hours uh, during church on a Sunday morning. Did you hear me? I'm going to say it again. In some locations, the most segregated time in the body of Christ is on a two, two hours on a Sunday morning. I had a survey that um, was sent to me from um, Tina Luther. She's in college down in, down in, where are they, Texas, Waxahachie, something like that. And so they have a whole list of things about your church. And this is, what, is your church multicultural? I said, yes. Well, who's in it? So I began to sit different things that we had listed there that are part of our church. And I said, not only that, I, and myself, I'm saying, I want more. I want every complexion, shade of people in this house. I want to see them on this platform. Amen. I want to see them everywhere represented. Amen. Now, let's get to this thing of talking about this because I need to wrap this up. Tenth point, but I'm taking the longest, all right? Here's the deal. I'll return and I'll restore David's fallen tent. What was David's fallen tent? It was a place where he brought the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this thing that God had given to Moses. Remember, he gave him the dimensions, how to build it, all that. It had been preserved up to this point in time. And they had brought it back. The Philistines had captured it. And they got it back from the Philistines. They finally, you know, the Philistines sent it back on an on a ox cart with an with a ox bringing it back. And it came back. You all know that. Then he took it and he brought it, tried to bring it up the first time, messed up. Remember, Uzzah tried to stable the, the Ark and he got pff, zapped. And he says, you got to read the word. you got to bring it back the right way. It's on the shoulders of the priests. How many of you are here today are priests? The glory comes on the shoulders of the priests as you praise and worship the Lord. When you understand David's fall intent, it's all about praise and worship and access to God's presence. Because he took that ark and he put it out there in a tabernacle and he rolled the sides up so it was like a tent, it was like a canopy. You know these canopies we sit under in the summertime when we don't really want a tent, we just want shade from the sun, but you got breeze blowing underneath. That's it, baby, that's what it was. And it was out there and it was just 24 7. He began to conscript the worshipers he brought in to his Levites and he says, All right, we're going to bring the Levites in and we're going to bring in gifted musicians. There were gifted musicians on this platform today. It's going to get so good, I can't even sing with them anymore because they're going to be out of my league. And I say, praise God for that. Are you hearing me? I'm going to do what I do, and they do what they do. So anyway, it says that he conscripted so that for 40 years, everybody say 40 years. For 40 years, 24-7, there was never a time that praise and worship did not stop. They would transition from one team to the next team. And what happened, there was continual praise and worship. It's where we see the minstrel. We see the chief musician. Our house, Helen's the chief musician. But there are minstrels and psalmists in the house. 
And they praise and they worship the Lord and they bring his presence by their praise and their worship. But you know what? They're, they're not the only ones. They're only helping us to, 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 to receive the glory of God because you've got to engage God for yourself because the glory comes when we begin to take the ark in on the shoulders of the priest and you're the priest and I'm the priest. There is no dichotomy. There is no separation. Am I a fivefold gifted leader? Yes, but that doesn't mean it separates me from you. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. We are all priests of the most high God called to do what Jesus did. Do I hear an amen? I just get to train you to do what Jesus did. I get to teach you what Jesus did, but we're all going to do it together. We're all doing it together. So this conflict was this, hey, you guys got to be circumcised in order to be saved. He says, no, you don't. And then he says, hey, listen, he, he appeals. Now, James appeals to the Old Testament, and he tells him about praise and worship. He tells him about it's for all mankind. Verse 19, it is my judgment. Now, as the lead pastor, he says, I render my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Four things. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Why the blood thing? Because the life is in the blood. Read it in Deuteronomy. Read it in Leviticus. The life is in the blood. If you go to Israel, you cannot get a prime rib. You cannot get a steak medium rare. They won't serve it to you that way. They will cook your meat. Cook it till like it's leather because they take this very seriously to this day. The life is in the blood. Four things he gave them. Now, here's what happens. Verse 22, then the apostles, the elders with the whole church decided, I don't know if I've ever read a whole chapter in a service ever. Well, I have. It's just been a while. <laughs> then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Why? To settle the conflict. How many of you got to resolve conflicts? This is a church conflict that affects all of the churches that have been planted. They got to deal with this thing at the get-go. Because if the enemy can squelch it right at the get-go, everybody's going to run around and you've got to be a Jew. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep this. You've got to keep that. How about, didn't Jesus say, I fulfilled all of that? I'm amazed that there are some people today that want to go back and do Jewish practices. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not against experiencing Passover and having a Seder. We've done that. But come on, somebody, for you to keep the Jewish practices and laws and holy days and all that, give me a rip and break. You're going back under the law. Oh, I got to wear the tallit, the prayer shawl and all that. Give me a break. If you want to, fine. But it ain't going to get you any closer to God. Oh, I'm more holy. I got a tallit. Give me a break. You become, you become exclusive. You're becoming weird. Stop it. And why do I want to embrace all the Israeli stuff? I got a little Indian dance in as well as the, as the Jewish there. Now, I make fun because it helps bring levity to it, but I'm very serious about this. Don't go back under the law because you can't keep it. There's no way you can do it. You can't keep it. Now, if you have that stuff and it's a reminder to you, great, fine. That's, that's all good. But the common person can't relate to that. And we don't have to do that because it won't draw us any closer to God. Now, don't minimize this. I am for the Jews. I am for Israel. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for Benjamin Netanyahu. Helen, I've been to Israel. I love Israel. I'm for it. I bless it. God's going to bless it. And God's going to come and he's going to deal with Israel as a nation. And I'm for all that. Are you hearing me? But you know what? I don't sing. I don't, we, our, our culture does not do Israeli stuff. Thank you. We don't sing that way. And the whole body of Christ, went, we went on a rampage there for a while. We're all doing Jewish stuff, like it was going to make us closer to God. Haba, Nagila, Haba, Nagila, Haba, Nagila, hey, Mishmika. Haba, Nagila, Haba, Nagila, Haba, Nagila, ve, Mishmika. Haba, Nerani, na. Are you getting my drift? Are you going, praise God, thank you, Jesus, that's awesome. I'm getting into his presence right now. Now, that may have great meaning for Jewish people, and I bless that, but that has no meaning for us. And it's like, okay, I'm going to put on the yoke. Let's put on a yoke. Let's walk around with the yoke. Come on, let's put a yoke on our back. Let's go, let's go ahead and be burdened again. I'm going to carry this around all day. Am I making sense to anybody? Okay. 
So I'm trying to bring balance. I'm for Israel. I'm for the Jews. I'm for the nation of Israel because God loves them. But thank God salvation is for all mankind. So they say, hey, let's get this from the get-go. You don't have to do this stuff. It will become simply ritual to you and have no meaning. Now, these guys continued in that. Bless God for them. It had great depth of meaning, but it didn't for the Greeks or the Gentiles. Okay, after I get castigated by letters and calls and emails. No, I don't believe for that. So he says then, going on, they got these guys. With them, they sent the following letter. In the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Sicily, Syria, and Sicily. Greetings. We have heard that some of you went out from us without our authorization. Without our authorization. Authorization means they had no authority. They went on their own. And they caused confusion. Do you know there are people running around causing confusion in the body of Christ because God never sent them? Nor did anybody else send them. They went but weren't sent. They went but weren't sent. I'm preaching better than your amen. (laughs) They went out from us without our authorization and they disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas, these guys are now from Jerusalem, to confirm by word of mouth, they were both prophets, by the way, but we're writing, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from fruit sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Let me wax eloquent for a minute more because I have 10 minutes on my clock. Now don't go looking up there because you're going to be going. <laughs> sexual immorality is bigger than adultery or fornication. The word is pornea, and it means all forms of sex outside of the marriage relationship. Now, their culture in Greek culture was used to having sex with temple prostitutes. It was normal, and it was, it was okay by culture. Now, I don't know if you can wrap your mind around that, but that was so. They would have in any given city a tell, a mound, and on it would be like a temple to Diana, Aphrodite, on and on and on. And on any given day, you could go there. There'd be temple prostitutes, both men and women, and you could go have sex with them as an act of worship, and it was okay. But, but these guys are saying, ah, urt, urt, hit the brakes. No, no, no. That doesn't work. I'm also mesmerized how we've adopted a mindset in America, the American church, that we think it's okay because of, I think, there's no mooring in the Word of God on these teachings regarding this. But I'll just tell you what the Bible says about it. When people say, well, we're just going to live together and we're going to spend this time to get there and see if we're going to be okay with each other, you know, we'll, we'll have sex and all that and we'll see what we're right. That's garbage. You don't get that opportunity as a believer. I want to appeal to the book of Galatians chapter 5. It says, and it lists a whole litany of things, and it says at the end, those who live like this, that means it's a lifestyle, knowing God's truth, and I don't want to be God on judgment day because only He is God. I'm just telling what the Word says. Those who live like this in sexual immorality, knowing it's wrong, perpetuating it, continue to do it, will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not my words. That's the Bible. You've got to deal with that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, I hope you're not smoking a pipe. <laughs> you know what I mean. Bigger speech. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, I'm just going to stomp on everything today. I'm going to get it all. Yeah, all right. So, off they go. Farewell. So the men went off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for encouraging the mess for the encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. That's back to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they had, and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord again for about a year period of time. We would call that for missionaries today. They're on furlough. They're resting and recuperating. They're in their home church. But I want you to know something. They did not usurp the authority of the house. They were under the authority of the leadership of that house. Are you hearing me, saints? Even though they are both apostles. Okay, that is resolving conflict in the church-wide context. Now, let's deal with it in personal conflicts. Anybody ever have a personal conflict? Okay, 
I'm almost done. Stay with me. Pick it up. Verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called John Mark or John Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take them because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Remember, when he first took him, they took him on the journey, John Mark bailed out. Now, I don't know if it was because when he got to Paphos and he got there and Simon Bargius and this guy erupts and, and the demons are coming out, it was like too much for him. He says, I got to go home. I can't take this. Get me on a bus, man. Get me on a boat. I'm going back home. So he turned tail and ran. Paul says, listen, I don't want that, in my, I don't want that on my team. I want somebody that's proven on my team that's going to follow through. It's not going to turn and bug out. So Barnabas says, oh, no. Here's what happens. It says this, but Paul did not think it wise to take him. He had deserted them in Pamphylia and not continue with them in the work. Verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, who's also known as John Mark, and by the way, he, uh, Barnabas is his uncle. Did you know that? Mary, that is in Acts 12, is his mama. So it says then, it says that Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commanded by the believers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Sicily, strengthening the churches. Sharp dispute between two leading men of God. Yes. What do they do? They had to resolve it. And the end result was, okay, you take John Mark. Because remember, Barnabas, he's the son of encouragement. He just has love, 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 grace, 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 grace. Paul is not that. Paul is the polar opposite. Paul is an apostle-driven, task-oriented. Come on, get on the bus. We're going. If you either get on the bus or get off the bus, but we're going somewhere, bless God. And that's how we're going to do ministry. I mean, there's different ways to do ministry. And one is one, and it's not one's right and one's wrong. It's just different. And so it's finding where you fit and plugging in with that and going with that. So they got, he, he got Silas and they went on. By the way, Paul, Paul and Silas, Paul, uh, Silas is a prophet, as I already said. So now you have a prophet, pref, uh, uh, apostle prophet team going together. Paul, and, and then you have uh, John Mark and Barnabas' his uncle, and they go to Cyprus, and we don't really hear too much from them later. However, from Mark, from John Mark, just so you know, they resolved this conflict. They were friends later. Paul said, and I'll get to it in a moment, about John Mark and his importance to his ministry. When you find out this, what happens is they go that way, they go this way. It's not insurmountable. What ends up happening is they double the, they double the effort. More people are reached is the end result. And it's just two different styles of ministry. Not one better, not one right, not one wrong, just different. That's why there are churches and ministries because of different styles, different approaches. If you're in this house, it's more like a Paul house. It's a good thing I have some loving people around me. And I need more of them. So if you're a love, mercy, grace type, come on, jump on. And love on each other. But I want us to go somewhere and do what Jesus called us to do. <clears throat> go with me quickly, because I'm out of time. Go with me quickly. Go to the book of uh, Colossians 4.10. And I'm now in my conclusions, just so you know where I'm at. Keep you informed. Colossians 4.10. Paul is now writing Colossae, and he says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. Note this, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instruction about him if he comes to you Welcome him. Now quickly go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. About Paul's affirmation of John Mark. Now remember, 1st, 2nd, 3rd Timothy are Paul's magnum opus. He's writing to his sons in the faith on what to teach, what to, to communicate. It's his final words. Take a look at verse number 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly for Demas... Because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. It's like, you know, you're not the only one that ever has a team member leave. It gives, you a good, it gives you a good feeling to know that you're not in this alone and that once in a while team members do leave. Paul, the apostle, two thirds of the New Testament, even had people leave him. How about Jesus? When he preached in John chapter 6, it says he preached about communion. And when he got done with it, it says many left him because they couldn't handle the teaching. It's amazing when a church is growing, thriving, and it's just excelling. That's a good time to throw in uh, uh, one, of those, one of those teachings. All right, here's what we really believe. And you see how many are left standing after the smoke clears. This is kind of one of those messages, actually. <laughs> 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 
Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Note this, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark, which is also John Mark, and bring him with you because he is helpful to me and my ministry. He didn't write him off. He just get him and bring him back. John Mark, by the way, just so you know, it wrote, you know, Matthew, Mark, he wrote the book of Mark. Peter was his mentor, distilled in him what he had seen and saw happen in Jesus' ministry. And then he becomes the author of the book of Mark, which is really a book that oftentimes is written to the Gentile mindset, if you want to know the truth. And it's pithy, bam, 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 how it happens. It's the book full of miracles. I love it. It gets you there now. Bam. Tells you what happened. Boom, boom. It's a power book. My kind of book. He says, get him and bring him. He's helpful to me in my ministry. Go back to Acts 16, please. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra. This is 16.1. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewish and believer. Oh, I don't, forget it. I don't want to go there. It starts a whole new thought process. I'll be teaching a whole other lesson. Don't do that. Here's how I want to end. Are you ready? Here's how I want to end. Apostolic and prophetic churches worship God. Well, these 10 things I already told you, you already have those. But in addition, this is an addition. This is my conclusion. They worship God. They reach the lost. For us, that's Eugene, Springfield, Lane County, state of Oregon, United States, the world. Seeing that people are saved, water baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. Three, they disciple the believer. What in? The elementary truths of words. That's the milk. That means doing devotions. They're attending church regularly. They give of their tithes, offerings, alms. They're serving. They're witnesses. They teach him the deep things of God. That's the meat. That's the gifts, the operation of the Holy Spirit and going deeper in the things of God and serving the Lord. They raise up leaders. That's five full leaders. They do it through services, the school of ministry, through mentoring, through releasing. They plant churches and they reproduce themselves. I'm going to share with you something that is written in Kevin Connor's book on the church. And I, I think it's important because I want you to see what churches of that time did and I think are doing today. And I truly do. This is my last salvo. And to mean it so much, I'm going to have the worship team join me to prompt me even more. Come on, worship team. Keep rolling tape. The church and the churches. It's important to note what the apostles, the founders of the church, did not do with these churches. Number one, they did not create a denominational church all of, lo of, of all local churches. Two, they did not use Jerusalem as Rome or as a mother church. Though Jerusalem reproduced itself, there was no centralization, nor was Jerusalem the the headquarters for all churches. Christ was the headquarters. Three, they did not have country churches. In, in essence, the Church of England, the Church in Japan, and so on. They did not have provincial churches. There were churches in the provinces, but never the church in, in, in the church in Galatia, the church in Macedonia, etc. Though they wrote to the provinces, they did not have a national church, such as the Jewish church in Corinth, etc. Six, they did not have a district church and bring all churches under a district. All churches, and I want you to get this, all churches, and I believe this, so we practice it. It's what we do. It's why we are where we are today. Did I used to be denominational? Yes. Am I denominational today? No, I'm not. We are a non-denominational, spirit-filled church that I believe is apostolic and prophetic, called to do what God's called us to do in this day and hour, starting Eugene Springfield and beyond. All churches were locally governed. They were autonomous and reproduce themselves accordingly. They were not welded into a great organization, nor was the unity an organizational unity, but the unity of the Spirit by the Spirit. However, there was not extreme independence in these local churches either. They did have a spiritual unity in Christ. There are eight guys of us that get on Skype once a month to chat, talk, discuss, etc. We hold each other accountable, call each other, minister in each other's churches. I have other friends of mine that I hold myself out to and they to them. How many of you know that Lou Wooten and Rocky are really a part of the flow of what we're doing? Though they're both different churches, but they have that same unity about what we're doing here and want to be connected. It says they did recognize each other's sovereignty under the Lord and the headship of Christ. 
They did share with each other and minister to each other as possible. They did receive ministers from each other. They did recognize that the revelation of Christ to one could be profitable for all churches according to Revelation 1, 2, and 3. What he said to the churches, although spoken to one local church in particular, is for the all. Let me give one more thing and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for giving me permission. <coughs> Though Antioch was not founded by apostles, but an unnamed group, but then established under apostolic ministry, Gentile churches needed teaching as they did not always have the scriptures as did the Jews. Jewish believers needed interpretation and spiritual application of scripture truths they already knew. To the Gentiles, all was new material and lifestyle. Thus, from Antioch, we have three great missionary journeys of Paul in establishing Gentile churches. From Jerusalem to Antioch, Peter to Paul, Jews to Gentiles in the order in Acts 1 through 12. It's Peter's ministry. While Acts 13 through 28 is Paul's ministry. Both are responsible for the founding of local churches. Peter's from Jerusalem and Paul's from Antioch. He always came back to that church, which was the sending church. Helen and I sat in a meeting Stand with me, please, because you really know I am going to be done. Sat in a meeting 10 years ago. Peter Wagner and Doris were right to the right of us. And we were chatting with them, and then Peter stood up and was taking questions. I think I might, I, I might have asked him the question or somebody that I think it was me, wasn't it? What about denominational churches? And he said this to me and then to the larger group that was gathered. He says, we are now moving into a time called the post-denominational era, where is the rising of the apostolic church. How many of you know denominations were not God's idea? That's man's. Now, God can work through anything. If he can speak through a donkey, he can work through anything. And so he says, you know, if I were to suggest to anybody, if you're in a denomination, you might consider moving away from that and getting out. It was 10 years ago. I was three years too late. <laughs> no, I was seven years too late. Yeah. Yeah, 10 years and then it was three years ago. Well, it's actually seven and a half. Well, I don't know. Three years, June will be three years, all right? End of June will be three years. So whatever the math is on that, take two and a half, three from 10. That'll give you. Come on! Now listen, I love everybody. God wants to work through anybody that's available. Are you hearing me? He wants to work through you. He wants to work through us to accomplish his purposes. Would you do this with me? Just lift up your hands. Say, thank you, Jesus. You're my Savior. You're my Lord. 